Uh, this is my fifth IESF uh, Detroit meeting. Um, I uh, really like coming here. Every time I come, I learn something. I was in the session this morning, the Linux session. Real good discussion uh, starting uh, about open source. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a subject that is really interesting to me, and I think it's a subject that needs to be uh, thought about deeply as to whether or not the automotive community can embrace open source. Uh, Wally, it's nice to see you. Always nice to be here and see Wally Rhines. James Price, thanks for inviting me again. Uh, many of you uh, are probably familiar with my publication, The Hansen Report on Automotive Electronics. I cover the technical trends that are shaping our industry. Since the last IASF a year ago, I've had the opportunity to speak at length with some of the auto industry's movers and shakers who talked about the challenges and opportunities they face as they work to make more appealing, safer, and reliable cars that people will want to drive. I wrote about my conversations with Alan Amici and Bruno Antonioli, the top Chrysler and Fiat electrical engineers who swapped jobs. Alan went to Fiat and Bruno went to Chrysler. And I recently interviewed PSA's top electrical engineer, Frederick Berant for a piece on the state of the art of powertrain electrical engineering. I interviewed Kent Helfrich in charge of electronics controls and software for General Motors, and also Craig Stevens in charge of global powertrain controls at Ford. Kent and Craig filled me in on some of their expectations for sensors, actuators, electronics, hardware, and software. Despite the growing trend toward vehicle electrification of the 103 million vehicles that will be produced in 2020, 100 million will employ a combustion engine. Even by 2020, less than 3% of the world's new vehicles will be fully electric, according to the Bosch Group's forecast. While there are many advanced engine technologies available to today's new vehicles, technologies such as turbocharging, direct injection, downsizing, variable valve timing, start-stop, improved thermal management, most vehicles don't yet take advantage of all those fuel-saving features. If they did, we'd see a 30% improvement in fuel consumption compared with standard port fuel injection engines. I devote half of every Hansen report to a company profile where I try to give my readers a true and realistic picture of a company's strengths and weaknesses and what it has to offer potential customers in the form of new products or unique technology. Since I began writing the Hansen report in 1988, I profiled almost every company in the world that is a player in automotive electronics, some multiple times, that includes not only the major Tier 1 and Tier 2 suppliers, but also some interesting and promising newcomers who are making a mark on our industry. I just profiled our conference host, Metagraphics. In the May issue of the Hansen Report, Metagraphics automotive business is growing faster than the overall automotive electronics market, for good reason. Its products are an answer to automotive electronics' rising complexity and automotive electronics will only continue to get more complex. There is a compelling need for engineering tools, software, and services. Mentor Graphics products support all automotive domains, including vehicle control systems based on Autosar and Genevi compliant infotainment systems. Mentor Graphic is nicely positioned to continue its strong automotive growth. Automotive electronics suppliers are almost completely dependent on car production for growth. After rebounding strongly in 2010, after the global economic collapse of 2008 and 2009, global, global light vehicle production has been growing more moderately, as of sales at the major automotive electronics suppliers. A noteworthy exception is the Japanese suppliers, for example, Aishinsiki and Denso, who were severely impacted by the loss of, the, of production following the terrible earthquake in Japan in 2011.
Most North American suppliers grew sales in, in double digits in 2011. The, European, the Europeans were in the range of 8 to 15 percent in growth, but dental sales were nearly flat, and Aishin Seiki managed just 2 percent growth. Today, I want to talk to you about two subjects. The first is a topic that I know is near and dear to you, a quick update on tools integration. Then the main part of my talk will be about a trend in automotive electronics engineering that will dramatically change the way cars think, the rise of automotive cloud computing. In a conversation I had a few months ago with PSA's top electrical engineer, Frederick Brand, he reminded me of a complaint I've been hearing for at least 15 years. He said, we have a lot of tools for model-based systems, for product lifecycle management, for configuration management, for validation, and so on. We're not missing any tools. Rather, I would ask, how do we use fewer tools in a better way? We want well-integrated tools that are simple. Several providers say they have high-level product lifecycle management tools that connect to local engineering tools, but I am still looking for a complete for a completely integrated solution, he said. Why aren't tools from different suppliers easier to integrate? I relayed Mr. Baran's comments to Serge Leaf, who is general manager of the systems level engineering division at Metro Graphics. Mr. Leaf's division makes an auto software, software design tool called VNA. I asked him, why the lack of integrated tool solutions? Serge told me the reason is because there were no standards, so it was not really worthwhile for software solution providers like Metagraphics to get involved. At best, they could produce a tool here, a tool there, based on local approaches. They can make a tool for PSA, another one for GM, something else for Ford. Serge said, the flows and methodologies in the automotive design world are based on a patchwork of disintegrated solutions from a variety of smallish, service-oriented vendors, and homegrown solutions. Step one, customers have to embrace Autosar. It is quite clear to him that a pre prerequisite for creating a comprehensive and integrated set of tools is a solid foundation of standards that have broad acceptance by customers, and that has only recently begun, become plausible with Autosar. While PSA has been positively inclined toward Autosar, they have not yet wholly accepted the software standard. PSA is not alone in its slow embrace of Autosar. Limited rollouts of Autosar began in 2008, and still only a very small fraction of VCUs made worldwide have Autosar software inside, only about 2% of the total in 2011. And many of those ECUs contain only elements of the software. They are not fully compliant. By 2016, I am told roughly 20 to 25 percent of all the ECUs produced worldwide will have Autosar. That is only counting implementation by the core Autosar partners, BMW, Daimler, Ford, General Motors, PSA, Toyota, and Volkswagen. But other car makers, including Hyundai, Fiat, and SAIC, have begun Autosar projects. Autosar momentum is building, but slowly. Tier 1 companies such as Continental and Bosch spend 10 or 20 million euro every year on engineers who labor not on software development itself, but on keeping the many different software tools they use interoperable with each other. By one person's count, suppliers like Continental use anywhere from 50 to 80 different tools, which vary depending on the car maker's requirements. Tool users face two kinds of integration problems. One kind relates to the engineer who might be running five tools in parallel and, depending on what he is doing, has to switch environments. He needs a smooth transition from tool to tool. The other integration problem that has to be solved, one that is even more crucial, involves simplifying the exchange of data between different tools. For safety systems, this is an essential requirement of the fun functional safety standard ISO 26262. Ralph Mueller, 
a director for the Eclipse Foundation, told me, the data must be exchanged from the requirements tool to the development tool to the testing tools. You need to prove that, yes, all requirements have test cases. You can only do this properly in an automated way if you have appropriate connections between the tools and different artifacts. ISO 26262, the Road and Vehicles Functional Safety Standard that defines the state of the art of automotive electronics safety engineering is already being taken very seriously by car makers worldwide. If they aren't adopting it outright or making sure uh, their existing safety systems are at least as good, they are certainly studying whether they will and how soon. Not only is ISO 26262 stimulating interest in software tools integration around Eclipse, it is also pushing the adoption of standard procedures to implement the, inter the interconnection of tools such as those defined by the Open Services for Lifecycle Collaboration. OSLC is a community of software developers and organizations working, for standards, working to standardize the way software lifecycle tools can share data, for example, requirements, defects, test cases, plans, or code with one another. According to Eclipse's Mr. Mueller, OSLC's promising new specifications are finding automotive and aerospace industry support. Some Eclipse projects are, are, are already embracing OSLC. I'm told that, the, that some automotive tool vendors have indicated that they are very interested in OSLC, but, quote, reserve the right to implement it in the future or not. General Motors is the only member of OSLC from the auto industry. A year ago, Bosch, Continental, BMW, and the Eclipse strategic member Itemus AG, IG, AG founded the Open Source Initiative for Automotive Software Development Tools, an Eclipse Automotive Industry Working Group known as Auto IWG. The Auto IWG meeting at, uh, last month in Toulouse, Toulouse, France, was sparsely attended. The founders were there, along with the functional safety expert Validas. I asked Auto IWG spokesman Ignacio Garro, who is head of engineering application systems and software at Continental Automotive IT Competence Center, why participation in the Auto IWG is so modest, given the enormity of the tool's interoperability problem. He said the Auto IWG has not actively tried to recruit new members. Rather, They've wanted to stay small and get some work done first. By the end of this month, the group expects to be able to release an Eclipse automotive tool platform they call WP1. The platform will include a number of Eclipse software components that are typically used in the auto industry. Some automotive software development toolmakers already base some of their tools on Eclipse, but they don't always use the same version which confounds tool, tools interoperability. Mr. Garrow said, the purpose of WP1 is to try to get everyone to agree to, to use the same versions of Eclipse. Once the WP1 results are available, he expects that some of the car makers who have expressed interest in the working group will decide to participate in time for the next meeting coming in October in Ludwigsburg. The tools integration problem will be with us for quite a while longer. I'm going to switch gears here and talk about a subject I've been hearing a lot about these days. And many of you probably have as well, bringing cloud computing to the automobile. Just last week, a couple of news releases from Verizon highlighted the, important, the importance of the subject. On June 1st, Verizon announced the, pur the purchase of Hughes Telematics for $612 million. And five days later, Verizon announced the formation of the 4G Venture Forum for Connected Cars to, quote, accelerate the pace of innovation across the telematics 4G LTE ecosystem. BMW, Honda, Hyundai, Kia, and Toyota are joining Verizon as initial forum members. The group will collaborate and explore ways to deliver connectivity and embedded cloud computing solutions to vehicles. Over the coming decade or two, 
Automotive cloud computing will bring about an upheaval in automotive electronics. No longer do car makers have to rely only on the computing power and memory they can afford to embed in the vehicle. They can go to the web to get whatever they need, as long as the vehicle has a reliable broadband connection to the internet. In its largest sense, the cloud is the internet. And automotive cloud computing means relying on internet-connected computing assets outside the vehicle. Automotive cloud computing isn't altogether unfamiliar to car makers. Telematics, which wirelessly links the vehicle to computing assets in the infrastructure, is a distant cousin. But cloud computing is vastly different because it links the vehicle to the internet. A connection to the cloud puts the vehicle in touch not only with enormously powerful off-board computers, but it can connect the vehicle to everything else in the world that is connected to the internet other devices, other vehicles, other machines. The potential is vast. To do this, cars first need a reliable, low-latency broadband connection to the cloud. A little while ago, I spoke with Dr. Ayman Duzdar, Director of Engineering for the Telematics and Wireless Machine-to-Machine -machine Group at Laird Technologies. Laird is one of the world's leading developers and manufacturers of automotive antennas. Laird is already working on LTE antennas. <coughs> to improve the functionality of LTE in North America, multiple frequencies will have to be accommodated. 700 megahertz and the advanced wireless service bands 1.7 gigahertz and 2.1 gigahertz. In addition to that, multiple in, multiple out functionality is needed for the LTE bands to enhance efficiency. That means that both the base station and the car will have multiple cell phone antennas, whereas before we had just one. Car makers, look, uh, car makers are looking to put this, this into production in the 2015 model year. More car makers are equipping vehicles with embedded cell phone modems. Of course, telematics pioneer OnStar is doing it, as are Toyota. Chrysler and Mercedes, among others. Embedded phones are way better than any handheld cell phone antenna, 10 to 15 decibels better. In contrast, Ford's approach with Sync and My Ford Touch relies on the driver's personal phone, which is more likely to be up to date with the latest technology. But car makers could choose to update an embedded phone every year or two. Laird's Mr. Dozdar thinks that Ford and other car makers will eventually come around and decide to put a cell modem in their vehicles to provide certain access to services. I believe that'll happen. Ideally, LTE will provide cars with super fast, always on internet protocol data communications equal to what many people have in their home. Verizon Wireless expects LTE's average data rates will be at least 5 to 12 megabits per second on the downlink and 2 to 5 megabits on the uplink in real world loaded network environments. That's about five times faster than 3G. The air latency of LTE will be roughly half that of 3G, 27 milliseconds compared to 55 to 60 milliseconds. LTE will facilitate cloud-based machine image processing and recognition for things like driver monitoring. And because voice goes over an IP connection, you can now use wideband voice and do natural language voice recognition in the cloud. LTE will enable new and improved telematics solutions that will invigorate the telematics industry. Not only will the auto industry be able to advance its traditional safety and security and diagnostic services, but LTE connectivity will help to enrich infotainment, convenience, and even driver assistance systems. Some people have expressed the concern that with all the data usage and the anticipated traffic as machine-to-machine -machine communications takes hold, cell phone network providers could at some point run out of radio spectrum. But according to a recent article in the New York Times, a presidential advisory committee, which includes executives from Google and Microsoft, plans to present a report that explores ways in which computerized radio technologies such as cognitive radio, which listens for interference and calculates ways to reduce it, could make much better use of spectrum. 
I got fired up about the promise of LTE and the internet some months ago after talking with Dan Dodge, CEO of QNX, who described how he envisions the role of LTE in automotive safety applications this way. I'm driving along and my chassis control system detects that my wheel slipped. That would upload automatically to a back-end server that aggregates that data, looks at the GPS coordinates of the cars behind me, and sends them a notification to slow down. The road is slippery ahead. Or, if several vehicles hit their brakes because of fog, the aggregator could inform cars coming over the hill that there is a slowdown ahead. There are vast resources in the cloud that could distill that information and send it back out without the need for big government investments in infrastructure. While safety solutions like the one that Mr. Dodge envisions are years away from realization, cloud-based solutions that advance the state of the art of the automotive speech interface are nearer at hand. And they don't require a 4G connection. 3G connectivity will do. Last month, Nuance announced a new automotive grade natural language voice platform based on Dragon dictation called Dragon Drive. The first applications of the new cloud platform will let drivers speak, listen to, and respond to texts and emails, something that is much needed when you realize how dangerous thumbing text messages into a smartphone while driving is. According to a study cited by NHTSA, text messaging on cell phone increased the risk of an accident or near accident by 2,230% compared to average driving. By the way, NHTSA's proposed distracted driving guidelines lean heavily on the speech interface. The main message car makers and suppliers will take from the guidelines is that future infotainment and communication systems should be designed to rely far less on visual and manual interfaces such as touchscreens and much more on voice interfaces and as we mentioned, advanced speech interfaces rely on the cloud. This past March, Nuance released for prototyping its Vocon hybrid connected software development kit that relies on a 3G connection for the speech interface in the cloud but still provides for some speech operated command and control features when the connection is unavailable. Voice recognition is very CPU intensive. The more computing power we can throw at the problem, the more sophisticated language processing uh, modeling techniques we can use. With the cloud, we are no longer held hostage to, the, to embedded architecture. Google's remarkable experiment with self-driving cars, which have logged hundreds of thousands of miles on public road, roads with only occasional human control, foreshadows the role the internet will play in automotive engineering. Google clearly believes that machines, which stay completely alert, don't panic, or get, it, or get distracted, can do a much better job than human drivers. And Google believes it has a commercial role to play what role? Clearly, Google won't be building cars or car parts. Google's corporate mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Providing cloud-based data services to car makers is in keeping with that mission. As Google told me not long ago, the problem of autonomous driving is about computer science and information and how to get the right information to the cars at the right time. That's made possible by Google data centers able to process the enormous amount of information coming from cars that are probing for the data needed to precisely map the terrain. Google already provides up-to-date traffic information today, which comes from cloud-connected vehicles acting as probes, to provide street views, which supplement Google Maps with 360-degree views of what can be seen from the ground, Google deploys manually driven vehicles equipped with cameras and other sensors, which are linked to the cloud. Advancing from street view to the dynamic 3D maps needed to support autonomous driving would not be too huge a stretch. And finally, my enthusiasm about the promise of LTE cloud computing and the internet 
was confirmed by a conversation I had last month with Dr. Bern Bohr, chairman of the Bosch Automotive Group. As many of you know, Bosch is the world's largest manufacturer of auto parts and systems. Bosch invested 3.3 billion euros in automotive R&D in 2011 alone. It is a very smart and innovative company. Bosch's newest strategic direction will take it toward what it calls the Internet of Things and Services, or IOTS, also known as Web 3.0 for the third generation of the web. Bosch describes IOTS as a megatrend that will lead increasingly to the exchange of information among things, where machines, equipment, and buildings communicate with each other. Top management at Bosch is committed to making the company a significant player in IOTS in all its businesses, including auto automotive. Speaking at Bosch's annual press conference in April, Volkmar Denner, who will soon be Bosch chairman, said this, up to now, software has generally been embedded in our hardware, on the Internet of Things and Services, technical devices of all kinds will communicate with your environment via Internet protocol. This requires that our products be web-enabled. With this in mind, Bosch might choose to acquire or develop Google-like competence in the aggregation and mining of data from vehicles, a capability that is sure to play a big part providing new services to internet-connected vehicles. Bosch could provide internet-connected vehicles with access to dynamic maps that are always up to date. Static maps shipped with navigation systems are typically only 85% accurate with respect to traffic limitations. Already competent in the area of vehicle repair diagnostics, Bosch will also consider implementing remote diagnostic services as part of its IOTS strategy. Dr. Bohr is also, also enthusiastic about the potential of LTE-based car-to-X communication, communications, and he sees an evolutionary implementation of safety-related features, possibly within the next three to five years. He pointed out that most premium cars have communications on them today, and OEMs are already collecting quite a bit of data, sometimes more than the user might know. The entry point he sees for car to x probably, uh, is probably with safety information. Possible early communications might include hazardous road condition warnings or an accident that's stopping traffic ahead. According to Dr. Bohr, safety applications that would include active intervention such as automatic braking or steering to avoid a click collision will require dedicated short-range communications because DSR DSRC uh, is faster and more dependable than cellular. He believes it will take at least 2020, though, before a car maker puts that type of system on the road. Despite the availability of the Internet and cloud computing, Bosch believes that computing on behalf of vehicle control systems, especially safety and engine-related functions, will stand better to board the vehicle for the foreseeable future. We will see about that. Uh, by the way, the June issue of the Hanson Report features a Bosch company profile with more about Internet of Things and Services. I thank you very much.